tries persuading the voters and the legislation to be on their side of that opinion. Um, so we have a small video regarding that. How do you get what you want using just your words? Aristotle set out to answer exactly that question over 2,000 years ago with a treatise on rhetoric. Rhetoric, according to Aristotle, is the art of seeing the available means of persuasion. And today we apply it to any form of communication. Aristotle focused on oration, though, and he described three types of persuasive speech. Forensic or judicial rhetoric establishes facts and judgments about the past, similar to detectives at a crime scene. Epidictic or demonstrative rhetoric makes a proclamation about the present situation, as in wedding speeches. But the way to accomplish change is through deliberative rhetoric, or symboleticon. Rather than the past or the present, deliberative rhetoric focuses on the future. It's the rhetoric of politicians debating a new law by imagining what effect it might have. Like when Ronald Reagan warned that the introduction of Medicare would lead to a socialist future spent telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in America when men were free. But it's also the rhetoric of activists urging change, such as Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream that his children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. In both cases, the speakers present their audience with a possible future and try to enlist their help in avoiding or achieving it. But what makes for good deliberative rhetoric besides the future tense? According to Aristotle, there are three persuasive appeals. Ethos? Okay, so deliberative is the future, raising interesting topics and attempt to better persuade listeners. Um, so on to integration. Uh, integration, so there's two, so there's communication tradition and communication context for integration. Um, for the communication tradition is rhetorical tradition, which is uh, talk as a practical art. So it's like an art that you could speak well, clearly to an audience, public speak, persuade. They, uh, the rhetorical tradition thinks it sees it as like an art, not everyone can do it. Um, inherent connection between rhetoric and human tradition. Uh, it helps us understand the influence of speech and how we can improve public effectiveness. Um, so what that means is basically see both sides of an opinion. So like I said before, um, if I think Dunkin' Donuts is better than Starbucks, I'm a, I'll, I'll listen to your, why you think Starbucks is better than Dunkin' Donuts, but I'd better think Dunkin' Donuts until you can persuade me uh, otherwise. Communication context is public and rhetorical. Um, it circulates circulation of information from one person to many others. So from you to the public, or you to a group. Uh, it could be a small group, it could be a large group. Three objectives as a public speaker is to inform, to entertain, and to persuade. I'm sure we've all heard that uh, term before. Um, so com com communication apprehension causes a problem for people to effectively persuade and use rhetoric. Basically, what communication apprehension is, is a, it's a generalized fear of public speaking. Is anyone like generally scared to public speak? Like, doesn't really like, enjoy it, doesn't like it, hated it, we got one? Yeah, I mean, not everyone loves to public speak. Public speaking is like a, a big fear uh, for everyone. Um, it happens to us all, we all get nervous no matter if it's a small group of bosses or in front of a class presentation. This is just Jerry Seinfeld. I saw a thing actually, a study that said speaking in front of a crowd is considered the number one fear of the average person. I found that amazing. Number two was death. <laughs> death is number two? This means to the average person, if you have to be at a funeral, you would rather be in the casket than doing the eulogy. <laughs> so basically, just joking around, like people are so scared to talk and because they don't have that that rhetoric skill, they, they have this uh, communication apprehension that kind of doesn't allow them to successfully speak. So, um, on to approaches to knowing. Um, there's interpretive and critical. So rhetoric has interpretive approach to knowing and critical approach to knowing. The interpretive approach, um, the participants being studied, 
values uh, values are important and the researcher needs to be aware that he and she and their values are equally important to the research. So what that means is if I'm doing the research and you guys are my um, participants or my subjects or whatever, my values, just like your values, are just as important because I could see it in a different way. Um, so for example, uh, Donald Trump's rhetoric gets interpreted differently. One side sees it as powerful, the other sees it as hate. Um, it's basically your, who you are, your values, how you see it will affect you uh, differently than the person next to you. Um, second is the critical approach. A basic understanding of knowledge relates to power. The researcher takes on a responsibility to change the injustice of the norms. Um, what this means is basically the researcher's changing of norms is an approach to change the world. So for the critical approach, um, you pretty much try getting a mass of people to change for, for what you want. For example, feminists, they want, they get together in big masses, they have this uh, subculture, I guess, and they fight for women's rights, they fight for equal pay, all that good